Rowley, the son of a milkman who makes his way to Oxford. Tell me about that journey. Well, a bit of an unexpected journey, to be honest. Um, so I grew up in Chesterfield and uh, went to normal primary and junior school, went to a, uh, a good state school, uh, which my mum and dad got me into. And my history teacher, uh, when I was 15, 16, said, have a go, and I did. I never expected to get there. And the first kid from my family to go to university straight from school. And when I rocked up there in October 1999, it was quite a, it was quite a change. But really privileged to go and it's taught me a lot about life and has given me a lot of opportunities which is brilliant. You know so I, I was the first in my family to go to university but I went to what was Birmingham Poly but even going there I felt very very out of place. I felt like I mean there's still I'd never really met anyone that had been to private school before. Did you I mean I used to cry all the time in my first term. Were you a bit more resilient than me? No, uh, I got there. I remember the first day that I got there and they gave me this tiny little room and my dad dropped me off and we put stuff in the, in, in the room and then we were supposed to go down for drinks. And, and I'd, I was walking into a room who I knew nobody and I just wasn't prepared for that. I didn't have the skill set to do that. So I stayed in my room and watched whatever was on at the time, Hollyoaks or whatever. And, and, um, and it, it, it took quite a while to get into it. I'm not really sure I ever properly got into my college at, uh, at Lincoln, who I you know, had a great time with, but in terms of the social side, never properly did it. And, but you learn these things, you know, you can't... I think I probably walked around Oxford with quite a big chip on my shoulder for a few years because everybody seemed to be doing it so well and I didn't get it. But um, it's, it's taught me an awful lot and I was very proud to be able to do it. Did you ever help your dad out on the milk round? Every day. <laughs> Every day, uh, from the age of a sort of slight child labour, from the age of about eight or nine, because my mum my was um, was learning to become a, a, a teacher. She was a, a, an adult teacher, so my dad was basically the guy who looked after us, me and my brother, whilst we were growing up. So at the very least, we'd be sat in the van uh, whilst he was delivering milk in the mornings. And then when we went to secondary school, it was on the other side of town. So we used to do an hour and a half getting there every day. So I used to deliver milk as I was going to school. And then on a Saturday, it used to be 5 a.m. in the morning as pocket money. So, you know, when I was in sixth form, I used to earn 20 quid or whatever it was for getting out on the Saturday and I'd go and spend it on Saturday night down in Chesterfield. Um, so, as you said, you were born and raised in Chesterfield. Both your grandfathers were miners at the yeah. pits in, in the area. Um, the... Well, all the pits have gone now, but the particular pits that your grandfathers worked at, West Thorpe and Shirebrook Collieries, both were closed under the Conservative governments in the 80s and 90s. When did you become a Conservative with that sort of backdrop, which, which scarred communities like the one that you grew up in? Yeah, I come from a, come from a pretty Labour family, actually. I mean, we're not that political, but the only politics we've done outside of me is is Labour. My aunt used to be off, work for Arthur Scargill during the mine strike, the NUM. Really? Yeah, and um, she she went out and campaigned for Tony Benn in the 84 by-election in Chesterfield next door and things like that. And I, I think mum and dad are very non-political and my mum thinks I'm slightly crazy to do this uh, as a job. I remember when I got selected and she said, why do you want to do this? Um, you've got a good job, why do you want to do this? Um, but they're, you know, they, they're, they're very good to me and, and they help me out a little bit. My mum volunteers in my constituency office and things and so that's brilliant. But I, 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 somewhere in the late 90s, I'm a total child of the 90s in terms of that time when we were optimistic and we had so many options and the world looks as though it was going in, 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 the, in the right direction. And um, somewhere there, I got interested in politics. And the thing that sort of was a incongruity to me was that the world seemed to be getting better, but my part of the world, North Derbyshire, where I grew up, it was just a, a lot of people, big names, people who were, you know, Dennis Skinner, Tony Benn, from a particular tradition. And they, you know, as a kid, I just watched them and they said a lot, and, but they didn't really seem to do a lot. And I remember going down to see Tony Benn as a sixth former in Parliament, first time I ever went to Parliament. And he, he did it again, he sort of said a lot, and I wasn't sure what he was doing. I've got a great deal of respect for him and what he achieved, and the same with Dennis Skinner and things like that, but I always wanted to be somebody who did stuff. And then somehow that got me into the Conservatives, and then 16 years later I got elected and here I am. You're a junior minister. Do you, do you enjoy that? I do. It's, it has its moments, but I really, really enjoy it. I think... Um, 
as somebody who wants to do things for my constituency and then whatever I can do to contribute to the wider discussion as a whole in the country, it's a, it's a great opportunity to do it. I'd like to be able to do more, get faster, you know, all the things that you get, but it's an opportunity to try and uh, to try the values which I think North Derbyshire have given me and which I think are the values which I think the country won't be perfect under, but I think the country will would, would, would thrive under and would be successful under. They're the kind of things which I try to implement every day with imperfect success. Has there been anything that has particularly surprised you, which you didn't expect to find, um, about the workings of government when you became a minister? Um, I, don't, I, I was a councillor before. I know it's different, but I'd sort of gone through... The, the processes of how organisations work and how government makes change and all of those kind of things but at a local level and now uh, at a national level. It's, um, I mean, I, I don't know if anything was that surprising having watched it for a few years. Um, it's about working out where you can pull levers because if the objective is to do things, you've got to know how to pull the lever to get things done. You're openly gay. Tell me about when you came out. Uh, oh, well, uh, I... I I think I'm a pretty uh, black or white person and I realised who I liked, who I loved at a pretty early age. I, and then I, you know, I just, just before I went to university, I said, well, I, to myself, well, I need to, you know, be, be true to who I am. And so I just started telling people and then it sort of went from there. I've never, I never really talk about it because I, it's, it's not a, big part of my political uh, my political approach I mean it's it's important I you know I, I, I but I you can hear me slightly struggling to find the words in it almost but I there's a lot of the gay community who just get on with stuff who just don't necessarily need to talk about it every five minutes and I think I'm one of those I'm very proud of who I am I'm proud of who I love proud of what I've been able to achieve in some small way but ultimately in politics the other stuff is the thing I went into politics for, the ideas, the values, the trying to change the constituency and go up beyond. Have you ever encountered homophobia either at university, in your community or in politics? Never in North Derbyshire. Um, and that is because they are, we are warm, open, tolerant, inclusive. You know, of course, there's people who you know, are silly, but there's nothing you can do about it. But I, I sort of, I don't, I don't look for it. I think I think there's a there's a tendency over the past few years where people are starting to look for grievance. They're starting to look for problems. I mean, life is full of things which don't work out. Where there are problems, where there are issues, where there's even unfairness, and you should try and work on those. But I, I don't think you can build a society. I don't think you can build your life on grievance, on things that haven't worked for you, on things that have that, that have been unfair to you. You've just got to say, well. Yeah, if that guy said that thing or that girl said that thing, well, fine. But let's tomorrow's a new day and let's let's get on with it. I mean, I've been very privileged in that there's not been a huge amount of problem there. But I, but I, but even the small problems I've had, I just think you just go right, fine. What's the next thing that we do? Because you just got to keep going. So I was looking at some of the things that you said in Parliament and during that whole debate on statues. Don't worry, we're not well, unless you want to. We're not, <laughs> we're not going to talk about statues. You said in that debate that everyone about to everyone who was a campaigner or everyone who had a view on something, stop cancelling your opponent. Yeah. Just explain a bit more about what, why you said that and what you meant by it and how worried you are that we are cancelling our opponents. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really worried about it. I mean, I was reading an article in The Guardian last night and this, 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 this article was all about how this person had had a piece of political literature through her door and it shouldn't have been allowed because it said something about gay marriage. People don't like gay marriage, that's up to them. I mean, I'm not asking them to get gay marriage. You know, it's, it's just let people, you know, I believe in that kind of Voltairean notion of you can say what you want, absolutely what you want, as long as it doesn't incite violence. And you, sh you have a responsibility not to use words in a way that upset or cause problems and things like that. But that's a reflection of you if you choose to do that rather than you shouldn't be allowed to do it. And I try to be really careful with my words. And I wish people would spend more time thinking about the care they need to take with words than trying to stop other people you know, saying things. Because it's not like they change what they're thinking. They just get more 
annoyed because they can't say it. Let's let them say it and then point out how ludicrous it is. I mean, that, that would be a lot more logical to me than just trying to ban people from saying stuff. And it doesn't work. It won't move our community, our society on if we don't engage with people and say, you're not being rational, you're not being reasonable, this doesn't work, because of this, this and this. And that's why the statues thing just really infuriated me because it's basically rule of the mob. It's basically a group of people saying, uh, you're, I'm telling you you're not allowed to say this, or I'm telling you you're not allowed, this thing isn't allowed to be here. And there's no due process, there's no, and ultimately if you replace one set of arbitrary things, which are silly statements or, or statements which shouldn't be made with another set of arbitrary things, which is I'm telling you you can't do that or I'm gonna pull this thing down. It's sort of as bad as each other. So say what you like, but be ready for be ridiculed about. I suppose some people would say, in order, if you are, if you have a cause or if you feel that your community has been wronged systematically, then sometimes you take extreme action. I'm trying to think about what they would say in response to that. Do you, do you, do you get that? Well, I mean, I'm a Tory politician, aren't I? So I've chosen to work within in the system. So there's a, and I'm, you know, I'm not, I, I think you can get greater change in the system than screaming at the system. Otherwise, I would be on a protest march right now, like a lot of the political tradition that my, my, my part of the world came from. And I'm, I'm really pleased that North Derbyshire has seen that, there's, there's an opportunity to try and influence things within the system rather than without the system. But a lot of that discussion starts from a principle of grievance and starts from a principle of power. And I just don't see the world in a, sense, in a kind of zero-sum game that if you have power, it stops me from doing things, or if I have it, I'm going to try and oppress you. you know, the life's not like that. Most, you know, the overwhelming majority of people are open, welcome, tolerant, nice, want everybody to get on. And if we start from that principle, rather than seeing these kind of strange patterns in the background about how you're trying to stop me doing something or I'm trying to stop the reverse, and then we throw all these words around in accusation, if we actually moved away from that, we'd probably get more done. Lee Rowley. I've, that was the perfect real me. I've learned so much about you, because even though we were colleagues briefly, I actually didn't know that much about you. So thank you um, for telling us your story. Thank you. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favorite shows, and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.